This video is brought to you in collaboration with wowhead.com. Hello everyone. The mysterious first ones. They're wrapped in quite a bit of mystery. The greatest minds have tried to decipher their language, their architecture, and clues that are left behind. But none of them have come up with some solid answers. Today, we're going to take a crack at it. Combining information from the Chronicles, the Grimoire, Shadowlands itself, and see if we can figure out what these first ones are all about. In the beginning, it is said that before life began, before even the cosmos took shape, there was light and there was void, unfettered by the confines of time and space. The light swelled across all existence, in the form of a boundless prismatic sea. Great torrents of living energy flitted through its midder depths, their movements conjuring a symphony of joy and hope. The ocean of light was dynamic and ever-shifting, yet as it expanded, some of its energies faded and dimmed, leaving behind pockets of cold nothingness. From the absence of light in these spaces, a new power coalesced and came to be. This power was the void, a dark and vampiric force driven to devour all energy, to twist creation inwards, to feed upon itself. The void quickly grew and spread its influence, moving against the flowing waves of light. The mountain tension between these two opposing yet inseparable energies it eventually ignited a series of catastrophic explosions, rupturing the fabric of creation and birthing a new realm into existence. In that moment, the physical universe was born. Or the Big Bang, you could say. Light and void clash with each other. The explosions and energies that forged what we call the Warcraft universe, with reality in the middle, the Emerald Dream and the Shadowlands are connected to it, the elements that surround it, and then the major cosmic forces. You got the domains of light, disorder, death, shadow, order and life. But what if these cosmic forces did not just automatically fall in line? What if they were actually forged, scribed, shaped to do so? That's where the first ones come in, at least according to the research of the brokers. This power is vast! The archives in Orobos, as well as the singing stones of Niram An, confirmed that it was the first ones who were the progenitors, not only of the Shadowlands, but of the very fabric of all realities. Six forces existed in strife, opposition to one another, an imbalance, until there was a need for something more. They came together, or they were brought together, depending on how one interprets the fractal, and gave form to their design. Each gave a portion of themselves, and thus the pattern was drawn. It is from here that the language becomes clearer. With a framework in place, all that we now comprehend came to be, as if reality were nothing more than the fungus growing upon the frame. Six forces, now in balance, and from their intersections arose others. A simple structure, growing infinitely more complex. A design that could answer questions like how or why did Aman Fool wake up to begin with, start to form his pantheon. The first ones might have been a catalyst in this, it might have been part of their design. Reality grew like a fungus upon their frame. So I read this as the first ones, they brought order to the Warcraft universe. They were the ones that laid down the foundation. They got these cosmic forces into an eternal tug of war. You might even speculate that from each of the cosmic domains, there might have been a first one. So a first one of death, a first one of light, a first one of void, all that good stuff. As we learned from Bastion, the balance between the forces, it is really important, or all would fall into chaos. But it is a framework, not a set in stone kind of deal. Rather, they, they laid down the foundation and it grew in complexity. It grew on its own, with the choices made by those that are inside this universe, just like it always has. Yet, on the other hand, you could take this and you could spin it in such a way that choice no longer matters. That reality as we know it has been created and forged by the hands of the first ones. There's a path, a purpose, a plan by their design, a prison guiding our every steps. Oh, you misunderstand. We're breaking a system that has always been flawed and remaking it into one that is just. <laughs> Do you expect me to believe 
that all this time, you've been fighting for justice. How can I convince you? From our first breath to our last, every decision is made for us. Then, the afterlife decides what eternity we must endure. We can't even choose who we... We couldn't control anything. But through the Jailer, control of our fate will at last be possible. While researching the first ones, the broker sought centers of knowledge that legends tells them has been shaped by the progenitor's hands. Places like Niram'an, which has those singing stones, Baranev, which is a new place mentioned, Corfia, the land that was hidden in the in-between, which has been used by the Primus to hide away a sigil. It's now been dragged into the mob by the Jailer to then claim the Primus' sigil. And then there's Ouroboros, and by extension the Shadowlands. Interestingly enough, you could also read this in such a way that it was the first ones that created it all, with lines like... The first ones, who were the progenitors not only of the Shadowlands, but of the very fabric of all realities. The great cycle between life and death, as well as the lesser pendulums that swing between light and shadow, order and disorder, all were conceived and put in place by the first ones, along with the pantheons that embodied their influences. All were conceived and put in place, which could mean that they came up with all of it, right, and then willed it into being. Or they conceived their grand design and they put into neat little places what was already there. That's personally the line of thought that I'm going with. The way that the Titans and the Pantheon brought order to the planets. A similar thing was done by the first ones, but on a much larger scale. A cosmic scale. Along with, you know, Pantheons that embody their influences. We know of the Titanic Pantheon and we now know of the Pantheon of Death. There's mention and speculation about a Pantheon of Life. Supported by the idea of Alune being the Winter Queen's sister, what kind of pantheons could Disorder, Void, and the Light offer? But okay, so the first ones, they got like this cosmic design going on, they dipped their hands into the Shadowlands, and then went to work. Ouroboros was crafted to serve as the arrival point for mortal souls, where they would be judged and placed into their fitting afterlife by the Arbiter. The domains that we visited, they're only a sample of the near infinite domains that the Shadowlands hold. Now we need to keep in mind that the research of the Grimoire, the research of the Brokers, it takes place between patch 9.0 and patch 9.1. So the recent revelations, they've not been considered and it paints a rather interesting picture. Their research, it talks about the purpose. Everything that happens, it happens through the purpose. The moment that we arrived in the city, they wouldn't stop mumbling about it, purpose be praised. And just as Ouroboros is the heart of the Shadowlands, so the purpose keeps the realms of death in balance. All beings in this endless cycle serve the purpose, even those who do so unknowingly or unwillingly. The attendants in the city, they believe that they were created by the Arbiter, and due to the purpose, they continue their work. They continue being her voice and her will, despite the Arbiter now being out of commission. And yet in Corfia, we've met a bunch more attendants, some that even have knowledge on the Sepulchre and the First Ones, knowledge that they're not exactly willing to share. These are not dedicated to the Arbiter, they're dedicated to the First Ones, and they have completely different roles, like dedicating themselves to the secrets of the city, or the fate that destiny wields. And then for the Arbiter's origin, they're very much shrouded in mystery, as those of her fellow Eternal Ones who rule the realms of death. Even a cursory investigation of the vulnerable architecture and detail presented in the Eternal City it would lead one to conclude that the Arbiter Station it must have been established long before the first mortal soul arrived to receive her judgments. Potential for Ouroboros and the rest of the domains in the Shadowlands to not have been there when the very first souls died. What happened to those souls before the first ones came up with this system? Is what we see in the Shadowlands truly the afterlife as it's supposed to be? But it was the wisdom of the first ones who believed the Arbiter to be best suited for the task among their children. She was shaped by their hands and blessed for this critical role. And yet, some amongst the attendants of the Arbiter, they continued to insist that it was her choice to dwell within the heart of Ouroboros. To efficiently facilitate the assignment of the never-ending torrent of souls to their intended afterlives. 
The first ones bestowed upon the Arbiter the ability to witness the entire breath of the life of each soul. She would use this gift to great effects in the eons after. The attendants insist that the Arbiter has always been fair, impartial and implacable. Yet in my research, I discovered certain ancient references to a time when this being was not quite so benevolent. But so worn and fragile were these records that I fear I cannot, in good faith, avow their veracity. With the ending of patch 9.1, we've learned a great deal more about Zoval the Jailer. Vague records speak of a time when the Arbiter was not quite so benevolent. A time in which Zoval still fulfilled that role. They've replaced him, and not even the attendants nor the broker's research are able to figure out that it was not the first ones that did this. Rather, it was his fellow eternal ones. But these days, no souls get sorted. Instead, they go straight down into the Maw, which has caused huge problems for the rest of the Shadowlands. With souls, there comes Anima, the lifeblood of this world. Brokers had never even considered hoarding the stuff for their own gains, since it was so abundant in the Shadowlands, but those days are now over. There was an attack, red of color, and that's what shut the Arbiter down. Still, there's been no clear answer what this attack was supposed to be. While partying in Revendreff, a domain with the purpose of paying for your sins, and by doing so, gathering a whole bunch of delicious anima. They did place the blame upon their sire, the Nephrius, and the grimoire it seems to agree. As the breaking of the Arbiter threw the realms into confusion and panic, sire the Nephrius employed the very spires of Revendreth to siphon the ambient anima and add it to his hidden stores. All the while, the drought's devious architect claimed to be just another victim of its tragedy. And know that I will lead us all into a brighter future. But why do you sort souls to begin with? Well, Anima, it sustains the workings of this afterlife. The system of the Shadowlands, the zones doing their things. It's a process that both yields and requires Anima. The first ones understood this. They understood that they were going to need a reliable stream of mortal souls crossing into the Veil. And so, Bastion was given the purpose of ferrying souls and making that happen. The progenitors must have known that oversight of this pivotal process, it would require an indomitable spirit with an unwavering adherence to duty and service to these mortal souls. The Archon of Bastion, a statisk being known as Kerestia the Firstborn, it would embody that spirit. She established a path that all Kyrian were to follow, never allowing her people to stray from her singular focus on the purpose of Bastion. Then in Arnenweald, they used that anima for a cycle of rebirth. The wild god Cenarius is a great example. When he died on Azeroth, off he went into the Shadowlands, Ardenweald, where he spent a bit of time recovering. Considering that he's a child of a loon, the Winter Queen treats him like his family, and after enough time recharging, off he went back to the Emerald Dream to eventually be brought back to Azeroth itself. This function supports their theories that the First Ones crafted the underlying framework for the cosmic forces of the universe, one that would facilitate an endless cycle of death and life which they made central in their creation. The role that they designed for the Winter Queen within this cycle, it was a vital one, requiring a bond between the conflicting forces so intimate that it's logical to assume that there's a being out there who serves as her counterparts. Yet, just as the Winter Queen assumed a place within the pantheon of death, this apparent counterpart took up a similar position in what we must hypothesize to be a pantheon of life. They're talking about a loon and the Winter Queen, one that's home in the domain of life and one in the domain of death. Now, seeing how the origin of the Eternal Ones is still unclear, it's hard to figure out how this relationship, how this bond actually works. Did the First Ones create the Eternal Ones? Or did they wake them up, similar to how like Titans woke up? Or did they empower and bless them, similar to how the Dragon Aspects came to be? Is calling each other brother and sister, is it truly a family thing, or more like a bond as strong as kind of deal? Questions still to be answered. Then there's Maldraxxus, to keep them all safe. As the Shadowlands is not a hidden away domain where none can enter, we've seen incursions from the void, we've seen the effects of the light, even our forces have ventured in before. The first ones wanted a way to protect their fort Shadowlands, to not only match, but to overpower all potential battlefronts ahead. And so, they imbued the very landscape of Maldraxxus with qualities that are unique amongst the infinite afterlives. 
the power to shape and alter the very landscape of Meldraxxus. That was granted to the Eternal One, who stood at the head of the Necrolords, the Master Strategist, known as the Primus. By his hands, the malleable flesh fields and bone spires of his realm were shaped to serve as the ideal training ground for the ultimate army. His stratagems and weaponry would prove to be infallible against his every foe. One account cites that the only losses the Primus suffered were intentional, as he felt there was more to be learned in defeat than in an endless series of decisive victories. Fate has drawn you here. The perfect excuse to use for next time that you might lose a game. So we got Bastion as their supplier. Ordobos then works as the sorter. Revendreth, which cleanses the bad products and is really good at sucking out the goods. Meldraxxus is there to keep them safe. And then Arnawield, it uses their goods to facilitate their cycle of rebirth. An endless cycle of life and death. Fitting that the symbol of the first ones is infinite, or a snake devouring itself. It's a symbol representing their cycle. A cycle that worked as it was supposed to, until Zoval wanted more. He wanted forbidden knowledge, that which the first ones hid away within their sepulchre. By combining their sigils, he would have been able to craft a gateway to the realm of the first ones. Zed of Mortis, they mention. Decoded glyphs and many ages of study translate Zed of best into keystone or cornerstone, and Mortis presumably meaning of death. But his plans were prevented by his fellow eternal ones. Zoval being so powerful that it took their combined might to stop him. But stop him they did, ripping out his power and then used it to make a new arbiter. His chains would be an invention of the Primus, the language of domination, its purpose being the utter suppression of another. Down into the maw they cast him, the place where irredeemable souls get to hang out. We now know that the Jailer was not always the Jailer, he is as much the master of the maw as the maw is the master over him. So far, every domain that we visited, it offers a purpose to the cycle, a reasoning to this great snake. But what purpose, in the grand design of the first ones, does the moth fulfill? Could it be that it was actually the eternal ones that took a domain similar to Corfia, then repurposed it into becoming the maw to contain Zoval? That could be an answer as to why we find a waystone of the first ones in there. Why would there be a waystone in the domain where you're not supposed to escape? If they took a zone like Corvia, which also housed the Waystone and simply repurposed it, that could be the reason. But still, we haven't been given a solid reason as to why it only responded to us. Modifying this system of the Shadowlands to no longer just use Anima to keep the cycle going, but now to also contain their brother. And by extension, they created a kink in this perfect circle that was created by the First Ones. An addition, a small change that would lead to its ultimate collapse. Since over time, the Jailer would learn how to turn his chains into a weapon. It would be he that mastered this runic language, the magic of domination. The Primus had foreseen this possibility, as he was able to leave behind messages before disappearing. A journey that took him into Corvia, another land that was forged by the First Ones. This was for him the perfect place to hide away his sigil. And then, some way, somehow, he was caught by Zoval, he was taken into Torgast, and he was tormented. If we got to believe the legends of the Primus, he never loses, except when there's more to be earned from defeat. Some for the consider, but as a prisoner of the Jailer, his mind was shattered to rip out his greatest designs. Tools that would lead Soval to claim the final prize, the secrets that the first one sought to hide. He ripped out the designs for Frostmourne and the Helmet of Domination, and then set his sights on a little planet called Azeroth. Death! comes for the soul of your world, mortal. But together, we may yet save it. Azeroth is mentioned time and time again as being this really special place. Death is coming for the soul of this world, and while there might be something really special about her, besides the planet that our character parties on, it could also be simpler, a matter of opportunity. It could simply be that Zoval didn't particularly care what outside a planet would herald his coming, would aid him in his liberation out of the Maw and all the things that went down. Rather, it was Sargeras that made Azeroth his prime target, because it was through Sargeras, Kil'jaeden and the Burning Legion that they wanted to conquer Azeroth, right? For the Dark Titan's biggest fear, that was a Titan waking up while being corrupted by the old gods. That's what was slumbering inside of our planet, and that's why he wanted to come in and destroy it all. 
by making use of the plan that already existed. The Jailer used the Dreadlords to bring over Frostmourne and the Helmet of Domination. The storyline of the Lich King now partying on Azeroth, that massive story played out. Nerzul and Arthas are described as failed heralds. They failed the Jailer, and Bolvar also managed to hold it all together. Yet along the way, there was another opportunity that presented itself. There was Sylvanas Windrunner. The cycle will be broken. At long last, we will have justice. They make note that prior to the events that caused the Arbiter to seize her judgment, the scribes and Orbos they claim that relatively few souls received this irreversible edict of banishment to the Maw. After all, those with even a slim chance to atone for their crimes, they were sent over to Ravendreth. And as we documented in our cartel travels, there exist numerous afterlives of temporary punishments for souls who merit it. So that leads to the obvious question. Why did Sylvanas end up in the mall to begin with? We've seen a garage in Ravendreth, a Lady Vush or a Kelfuzad in Maldrexus. Why did she end up in the mall? Did the Jailer still have a sliver of his sorting powers from the days of being the Arbiter? Maybe, but let's not forget that Arthas and Frostmourne, they were able to give him a piece of Sylvanas' soul. We've been kind of worried that they were going to use the soul splintering as an excuse for her deeds, but the recent Ufer dialogue, it does not seem to support that. So what if that soul splintering is instead used as a reasoning for why she got in touch with the Jailer to begin with? Fair enough. Ufer was also splintered and still made his way to Bastion. But perhaps the Jailer was like, good, you go on to Bastion. The time of hiding is no longer needed. You can show them that I've mastered domination magic and that I am breaking out. Show them that the path is indeed flawed, which then led to Arthas being dropped into the Maw, devils joining the Jailer's side, that whole Maw's foreign thing and all that followed. Being a hundred steps ahead of everybody at all times, it must be pretty great. But if the Maw was truly designed later as a prison to contain their brother so foul, then that sheds a light on the Eternal Ones, the souls that were condemned to eternal damnation. It also makes you question what Sylvanas' judgment would have been, what domain she would have actually been sent to. So, that's the influence of the first ones, and their designs of the Shadowlands. Zoval, he wants to reshape it all. Not a universe in which everybody is free, like Sylvanas wanted. Not one that's just, but one in which everybody serves him. Looking at Tazavesh, the powers of the first ones, they're heavily connected to the powers that make up the cosmos. Still plenty of mysteries and questions to be answered. Questions like, did the first ones pop up out of existence when the Warcraft universe came to be? Or did they make the Warcraft universe came to be? What role did they play in the creation of the Eternal Ones? What ties are connected between the different cosmic domains? What other pantheons and relationships exist? Are the first ones that we learn about in the Shadowlands, are they just the first ones of death? Could to be first ones for all domains that came together to make all of this happen? What lies within the sepulchre of knowledge? What secrets of the first ones is Zoval actually after? There's plenty to still discover as the story goes on. But for now, you're up to speed on what we know about the first ones. Say that you want more details on all the things that we talked about today. Or you just want to read up on it in your own time. Check out the Relayed Wild article in the description down below. And as always, thank you very much for watching everyone. Until next time. See ya!